10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. Liftoff of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. Go NASA. Go SpaceX. Godspeed. Bob and Doug. Welcome to your space journey where we venture into the future of space exploration and the incredible leaders who are taking us there. Here's your host, Chuck Fields. Hello, thanks for joining me today for Your Space Journey. Now, first off, we have to congratulate SpaceX and NASA and America for the successful launch of Crew Demo 2 with Endeavor and astronaut Bob Bacon and Doug Hurley on board. It was a flawless mission up to the ISS. They docked successfully and are now aboard there for an extended stay. At any rate, we uh, again are just so proud of that moment and uh, just so happy for the future of space exploration and the fact that we can now launch again from Florida's space coast. Now, today we're still gonna go into the realm of astronomy with my friend, David Eicher. Now, David Eicher is one of the most widely recognized astronomy enthusiasts in the world. He has been with Astronomy Magazine for 34 years, beginning as an assistant editor and working through associate, senior, and managing positions. He's been the magazine's chief editor since 2002. Now, Dave joins us today to discuss his latest book, Galaxies Inside the Universe's Star Cities, which just came out on May 31st. But before we get to my interview with Dave, I want to share the space journey of my friend, Jeremy Miller. All right, so my name is Jeremy Miller. I'm a marketing consultant and co-founder of a nonprofit that works with high schoolers. We focus on innovation. My uh, journey with space started out, I was pretty young. Um, like ever since I was a kid, I was just like enamored by the whole concept of like astronauts. And like a lot of people are, but like, I just had this like close affinity to it. But it was, I don't remember like what grade I was in like elementary school, um, but there was a time where I came, it was like a career day or something. And I was having a conversation with a teacher and long story short, you know, I kind of got this vibe from my teacher that I would not be able to be an astronaut because I had, I have consistently in school had bad math grades and like, you know, you know, astronauts, it's like rocket science and physics and just like math and ca at a, you know, calculus at high levels. And like, I almost like had this like vengeance from like a young age that like, I was gonna be involved in the space or marketing for the space. Of course, at the time I wasn't even about marketing, but I was gonna be involved in like the space some way, somehow. And of course, at that time, I only thought the only role within space was like being an astronaut, but of course there's a plethora of other roles um, but just the concept of space just like intrigued the heck out of me. Just like the vast, you know, possibilities was so humbling to me. The fact that like we're like the space that humans occupy is so small, but the fact that we're a part of this universe, whether we're the center of it or we're not, like is also just like very, very exciting at the same time. Um, yeah, space is just like really been, been something that I've been excited about. Out and I'm very excited for you know coming up here in May when for the first time you know humans are going to be going back into space since 2011 when it got shut down. So I'm I'm, I'm very excited for that. Your space journey. Thanks, Jeremy, for sharing your story. If you'd like to share your story, just check the show notes for ways to submit your space journey to us. Now for our interview with Dave and his amazing book about galaxies. Dave, thank you so much for joining me. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Chuck. It's always really a pleasure to talk to you. Someone so knowledgeable about everything. I tell you, it's an, it's an honor too. And I love this shared passion we have of astronomy and talking, of course, to the editor of Astronomy Magazine. It's a sheer thrill for me. But one thing that we always talk about, and you've told me this before, but I want to just go into it for our audience on this one, is what first got you into space? I understand it all started with a star party, if you could tell us more about that. It did. You know, I was the son of a chemist, an organic chemist, so I kind of grew up around a science laboratory, if you will, at a university, and you never really want to do exactly what your dad did. So I was interested in science very much, and I maybe wanted to be a physician and get into medicine. Well, I made the mistake of going to a star party, and I looked through a little telescope and saw Saturn and its rings just walking out into someone's backyard. And I was electrified as if struck by lightning. And I knew I had to get into that. So I was hooked 
really literally in an instant at about age 14. See, I think that's interesting too. And I have almost the same timeline as you, but at age 15, I understand you actually started editing Deep Sky Monthly Magazine. Tell us about that because I want to hear how you did that and how that sort of led to your role at Astronomy Magazine. Yeah, it's a little generous to call it at first a magazine because early on it was produced on my dad's chemistry office mimeograph machine. But uh, I sort of got hooked in originally to writing about uh, something I was really interested in uh, using just a pair of binoculars at first with this guy, clusters, nebulae, and galaxies, deep sky objects, objects beyond the solar system. And so I love tracking those down and seeing what they were and how far away they were and so on. So I started writing in our club newsletter, a local club newsletter, a column about that. And it just kind of caught on. And so it led to, well, there ought to be a whole publication about this. And that coincided really with this period in amateur astronomy, the so-called Dobsonian revolution of people getting large mirrors cheaply for the first time with their telescopes so that you could see this really faint stuff that a lot of the books said, you're not supposed to see this stuff. And yet you could go out and see them with a six or an eight or a 10 inch telescope. So we filled up a whole magazine of, of deep sky observing stuff and, and science about those objects. And that led to me going to Astronomy Magazine. And I've just never found the exit ever since. You know, I never, <laughs> well, you know, you've I, been I found for 30 that, years. That's it's incredible. Tell me about it, that career. How did you work your way up to editor? That's amazing. Well, I think if you hang around long enough at a place, eventually they put you in charge of things. You know? If but, you're good. But, uh, <laughs> I, Which you are. And, you know, I, I had a physics education and wanted to be an astronomer, but then got into journalism fairly early in an amateur way and got to know the people at Astronomy and Sky and Telescope and the other places. Uh, they're all friends. And I just love writing and popularizing this stuff. And, and so I uh, had the, the small deep sky as a quarterly for a while, too, and then eventually just took on a bigger role with the astronomy. And it's a great place to be involved in all these areas of the science uh, and get to write about it all and know everyone and what they're doing in planetary science, cosmology, galaxies, stars. There's so much going on. We're really in a golden age of astronomy right now, which is incredible. Yes, we are. And I, I'm proud to say, and I'm not bragging, I'm just saying, I have been an astronomy subscriber since my early teens. <laughs> and I love it. It's, it's still in print, of course, which we love. I mean, I know I can go online, which I do, and sure. see everything, but I just love holding that magazine. And uh, I got one around here somewhere. And it's, it's just awesome on, on it. And one thing I, I did want to talk to you about is, obviously, you, you're a writer. You've written 25 books and your latest book is the one I want to talk about today. It's called Galaxies Inside the Universe's Star Cities. Can you give our audience just a general overview about that book? Well, you can't make this stuff up because the first copy that I have literally came about there two hours is. ago. And Very so nice. here it is. It's coming out in two weeks, in fact, officially from Penguin Random House from uh, their division called Clarkson Potter. I loved a book called Galaxies when I was a teenager getting into all this stuff by the great Tim Ferriss, the great yes. science writer. And it was all that we knew. It came out in 1980. It sort of carried you off to these distant parts of the universe. And I thought someday to myself, I'm going to write a book about galaxies way on down the line. And that was 30 years ago. And so finally today the book came literally and what we know about galaxies now has really exploded over the last 10 to 15 years. We know that most all of them have a central black hole now. We know that how many there are essentially a hundred billion galaxies in the present day universe. We know that many, many galaxies merge and over time into larger structures. We know the Milky Way is a barred spiral galaxy, the type that it is now, which we didn't know until fairly recently. All these many, many, many aspects of galaxies we really didn't know until just a few years ago, recent times. So this book summarizes all that stuff and has an incredible amount of uh, imagery photos from both amateurs and Hubble Space Telescope and the professional observatories on the ground 
and lots of diagrams too. And there's a lot to learn now about galaxies. Not all hundred billion are covered in this book, but some <laughs> fraction. Well, it is going to be amazing. I cannot wait to get my copy. I cannot wait. Again, it's out May 31st. Um, what what fascinates you about galaxies? What sort of draws you in and says, wow, these are just incredible? I've always loved them. And now we're in a bit of a day and age when, you know, video games and kids, you know, the kind of electric excitement that we have with entertainment maybe doesn't lead you down this path. But I've always loved, you know, seeing the real live photons, knowing that light from the Andromeda galaxy that you're seeing in the eyepiece right now this evening left that galaxy and has been traveling through space at the fastest speed there is for two and a half million years. I mean, to me, that's seen the most extreme kind of nature there is. And we know that you can see off tens of billions of light years now that the universe has expanded over its 13.8 billion years. You can literally see all around the universe with a backyard telescope. And that to me is mind blowing. That's kind of what got me long ago and it still gets me. See, I love that. And even in your book, you have a section on how to view galaxies through your telescope. And mm -hmm. I'd love to hear about that, but I'd also love to hear, I mean, obviously we're approaching summer now. It's one of the best times of the year to see the Milky Way galaxy. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks out there, I was surprised how many have not seen it. So what advice would you give, I guess, for those who want to see the Milky Way um, and also those who actually want to try to find a galaxy through the telescope? What would you say? You know, it's a little tougher for us now, and it requires just a little bit of determination for many of us because, you know, 200 years ago, everyone had a dark sky. And now, most of, many of us live near cities, and that means light scattering upward and light pollution that makes a dark sky harder to see. So really getting away from the cities into a kind of a dark sky and away from local lights right around you waiting maybe a half an hour to an hour uh, and letting your eyes adjust because they actually get more sensitive to light over that time. And then during the summer evening skies, you can see the band of the Milky Way going across the sky. That's the unresolved light of billions of stars within our own galaxy seen from within. And with a four, a six, or maybe you know an eight or a 10 inch telescope, the larger, the better in collecting light, of course, but then again, the larger the telescope, the harder it is to lug around. So yes. <laughs> uh, you need to strike a balance there with telescopes. But with a small telescope, you can see dozens to many hundreds of galaxies uh, in a simple small telescope for a few hundred dollars. So you can really travel and get a bit of perspective, especially in these challenge uh, of unprecedented times we're in now on what else is out there. You know, we have one little planet here we're on, but it's an awfully big universe out there. And that gives us a lot of cosmic perspective on where we are and what we're going through as a civilization. See, I love that. And you sort of mentioned this to before, but I'd love to hear, what was it like when you first saw a galaxy through a telescope? Like my experience was with the Andromeda galaxy, obviously in just the immense distance and we're seeing the light now, like you said, from two and a half million years ago. What was your first experience like when you looked through a telescope saw a galaxy for the first time? Well, it really kind of blew my mind. And of course you get better with it as time goes on. Your eye gets used to seeing the subtle light and so on. And I, I had a pretty, uh, you know, a little bit of a spoiled beginning because after about a year with binoculars in which you can just barely make things out like galaxies in a good sky, I jumped into a Celestron 8 telescope that was a really nice, fine telescope. And I also grew up in a place in rural, suburban rural Ohio, uh, southern Ohio, where you had a pretty good dark time. I could wander out from my house into a farm field behind our subdivision and have a pretty dark sky right off the bat. Um, so that was nice too. But I, I think that I, you know, I felt like I was, it enabled me to travel mentally out 
in space and see how incredibly large the universe is. We think of our problems here and our challenges on Earth, but remember, uh, just within our galaxy, the nearest star, if it were the size of a, if the sun were the size of a pea and you placed it in London, then the nearest star would be a tad smaller than that and would be sitting there in Paris. So the distance scale of our universe, that's just the nearest star of 400 billion stars in our galaxy, let alone all the other galaxies. It gives you real perspective uh, seeing these things for yourself in that this is an, an, an incalculably large universe that we live in and we ought to take good care of the place, the one place that we really have here down on this planet. That is so true. Now, I love how you talk about the scale. And I, I want to ask how your book sort of addresses that. Because, I mean, I know you, you pointed out how even the Milky Way galaxy from one end to the other, it would take light 100,000 years just to go across that. How does your book talk about just the immense scale of the universe? That's a very good question. And, and the numbers and the scale, they're so large, it's hard for us to grasp all of this stuff, especially when we get far out into the universe. So I sort of set it up as sort of traveling through a spaceship, if you will, of the mind, very much like our pal Carl Sagan did, you know, many years okay. ago with Cosmos. And so, you know, if you imagine you, you, you can travel the speed of light and you, it takes you a hundred thousand years to go across our galaxy's disc, which is not our whole galaxy even, sure. then, you know, we go out to the nearest galaxies around us, the sort of so-called local group of galaxies. We're in a small group of uh, at least 55 galaxies that we're in together. That's about 10 million light years across. And then we get to the nearest cluster of galaxies, rich cluster of galaxies near us. That's 55 million light years away from us. Well, that's nothing still because the uh, diameter of the universe is nearly 100 billion light years since it's been expanding from the Big Bang. And there you get out to the extremes, to these big walls and sheets and filaments and super clusters of many, many thousands of galaxies together that are the most distant structures we know of. So it kind of does blow your mind a little bit and you need to hang on and, and try to compare all these scales, but, but it's what we have. It's the universe we live in. See, I love that. And one thing I too, I, I love just how you call it the universe's star cities. Because I know the, the, one of the terms I heard uh, growing up, you know, island universes. And one thing that I thought was really fascinating is, again, you know, we used to think hundreds of years ago that the Earth was the center. But mm. I understand that even astronomers, before galaxies were really defined, they thought, well, the Milky Way is all there is. And I think you talk about the, you know, the, in the debate how Edwin Hubble, um, sort of helped, uh, I believe, Heber Curtis, if I have his name right, Absolutely. discover that yes. galaxies were actually composed of stars and themselves. Can you tell us just a little bit more? I know it's a, a huge thing to undertake, but just a little bit more about how galaxies were first identified for what they are. That's right. And, and it was going way back to the philosopher, the natural philosopher, Immanuel Kant, uh, coined the term island universes before oh. we really knew. But there was great debate on the scale of the universe and whether these fuzzy clouds, some of which showed this real spiral structure of rotation uh, as they were sketched by the Irish astronomer, uh, William Parsons, the third Earl of Ross, back in the 19th century, but nobody really understood the scale or what was in everything else. Uh, and there was a great debate about the time of World War I about this between uh, Heber Curtis and Harlow Shapley in Washington at the Carnegie Institution there. Um, and, you know, that it was unresolved. And so really it, it led to, in the early 20th century, two astronomers making a big breakthrough. V.M. Slipher at Lowell Observatory discovered that these spiral nebulae were moving away from each other with his spectrograph there, redshifts, so-called. And then, of course, the big breakthrough in terms of understanding the distances and the nature of galaxies, really, was Edwin Hubble with the uh, Mount Wilson Hooker telescope there. That was October 5th and 6th, 1923. 
he took a shot and discovered a particular kind of star that varies in brightness that was clearly identified its type. And it was so faint compared to the ones that we knew he could calculate that that uh, Andromeda nebula, spiral nebula, as it was called then, was much farther away than anyone. It was three times farther away than anyone imagined the whole universe was at that time. And that was the breakthrough that led to the understanding of galaxies. So I, I thought that, and I love how you wrote that in your um, recent article in Astronomy Magazine, how he thought it at first was a nova and then realized, <laughs> no, this is a variable. Totally expanded the size of our known universe at that time. Incredible. Now, one thing I can't wait about your book too is you have pictures of all these incredible galaxies. You've got over 200 pictures and images, you know, some from the Hubble Space Telescope, some from ground-based telescopes. But I think some of our um, viewers may not know that there are just different classifications of galaxies. You know, you mentioned spiral, you mentioned elliptical. Can you just give us a just general overview of all the different types of galaxies there are? Sure. And it was none other than Edwin Hubble who started the classification of galaxies. And they were three basic types right off the bat. Spiral galaxies, barred spiral galaxies. For many, many decades, we thought the Milky Way was an ordinary spiral galaxy. Now we know our Milky Way is a barred spiral, but that's a different story. There are spirals, barred spirals, and there are elliptical galaxies that are just big, disorganized fuzzballs. However, lots of little twists on all these started to be found. And by the late 1950s, a French astronomer who came to America uh, and went to the University of Texas, Gerard de Valcalor, who I had the privilege in late in his life of knowing, getting to know and so on, he reclassified things and added a more sophisticated classification system than Hubble. And he had rings with galaxies and so-called lenticular galaxy, lens-shaped galaxies, peculiar galaxies that had strange properties and uh, also lots of studied lots of interacting galaxies that were colliding with each other. So really the, the sophisticated organization of galaxies uh, and all sciences, of course, start out with classifying things before we really understand them, you know. Right. That really took off and got well-defined by the 1960s and 70s by Gerard de Valcalur. Very nice. Got to ask this, how can our audience get your book? Where can they go to order it? They can go to myscienceshop.com and they can get a copy from the publisher of Astronomy Magazine. They can find it on amazon.com, of course, as well. Galaxies Inside the Universe's Star Cities. Um, and I actually have a little bit of a surprise too, Chuck, if you don't mind, because I have a second book coming out. Oh, let's uh, tell me about it. I just got a copy of it too. This is <laughs> when it rains and pours. This is a book I've done with my pal Brian May again, and and we've leaned on this time. This is, Brian is very much, I think, as you know, into stereoscopy, stereo, yes. seeing the world through stereo through three dimensional views, which he got really turned on to in his childhood. Uh, and so we did this Mission Moon book a couple years ago on Apollo. Well, now we're simulating stereo views here, but there's an incredible Finnish astro imager called J.P. Metzavanio. He's an incredible astrophotographer, and he's actually taken these images and reduced the data and created 3D simulations of nebulae in our galaxy. Wow. So the first... when, when does that come out? It comes out in the U.S. in about six weeks, and it'll be actually in September in the U.K., U.K. edition. Very um, nice. So that will show you nebulae for the first time in three dimensions. See, that's incredible. And yes, the Brian May folks he's talking about is the Brian May from Queen. <laughs> he has a big job as well. He plays guitar. Just a little um, bit. <laughs> yeah, he, he uh, does rather well with that. So it's rock and roll and it's imagery. And, and he actually, uh, you know, nearly finished his dissertation when Queen really started to take off, went back years later and finished his PhD. Um, so he is Dr. Brian May, uh, who has a PhD and has done very sophisticated studies of dust in the solar system. So Incredible. Very, very into it. Now, what, what, is it, what is it about science and music 
because you are in the blues band, right? Tell, tell me about your and band. Again. I love rock and roll and, and, you know, electrified blues as well. And, and nice. you know, Queen, obviously, too. <laughs> so, you know, as Brian says, you know, you got to exercise both hemispheres of the brain. You know, you, yes, you can work intensely hard on science and analytical thought and reasoning, but you got to have some fun, too. And let it go with the artistic side. And so both of those things are are really, really important. Oh, well, Dave, these are incredible books. I cannot wait. And I just want to ask you real quick, if I may, what's coming up in Astronomy Magazine over the summer and fall? What can we oh, boy, to? we've got a lot of things going on with the magazine, including some special issues, some new series of videos that we're going to roll out. We have a couple of staff members who are still doing some things for us but two longtime staffers retired. And so we have a couple of new editors. So we're going to be doing some fun things with them. This is very nice. And folks, I can't recommend Astronomy Magazine enough. It's just, it's wonderful. It's wonderfully well-written. Um, if you're a novice or if you're a seasoned pro, it's just a great magazine to really learn your way around the sky and the universe. Dave, I just want to thank you so much for joining me today. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chuck. Always a pleasure to be with you and bless you. Stay safe your space journey well i really enjoyed my conversation with dave and i'm excited about his book galaxies inside the universe's star cities it's available right now you can purchase it at myscienceshop.com of course if you'd like to learn about astronomy magazine which i highly recommend just go to their website at astronomy.com I want to thank Dave for joining me today. Also want to thank Jeremy Miller for sharing his space journey earlier on in the episode. Again, we want to thank you for taking time to join us today. If you can do us a favor, if you're listening on whatever podcast application, if you can give us a like or a five-star rating, we would certainly appreciate it. If you're watching YouTube, if you can subscribe, it's free and give us a thumbs up. We'd appreciate that too. We would also appreciate it if you'd share this episode with a friend. But anyway, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. We do appreciate it. We'll see you next time. God bless.